thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you guys for coming. Do I have any of my students here? So, okay, cool. I mean, you guys are all our students, so. Um, I'm excited to share with you um, the research in my lab um, that we've been doing for the last three years. So I've been at UT for about two years and a half. And during that time, during this time, we've been developing what we call the mass spec pen. And what I hope to show you today is how exciting this technology is and the opportunity it gives to detect cancer by touch. But not only cancer, there's a lot of other um, applications that can be undertaken with this technology. And maybe my talk today will inspire you all to think about new applications and things that you can do with um, chemical studies. So I'll start by telling you a little bit about my journey and how I got here to doing this kind of different research and the intersect between chemistry and medicine. So I started doing research almost exactly 15 years ago and 5,000 miles away from here. I'm originally from Brazil. And at that time, as a freshman in college, um, I was starting to use mass spectrometry for, um, in my research. So this was the first instrument that I used. And you guys see this panel here? This is what we call a penta quadrupole. It's a very, very sophisticated mass spectrometry instrument. And, we, and I used to sit right in front here of this panel and adjust every single knob um, to get my voltages right and all of the audio optics in order to be able to do mass spec analysis. And this was a really, really difficult work. Um, this instrument in particular didn't even have like a software that we could just plug in the numbers and press enter. You literally had to adjust all of the voltages by hand. And at that time, I was studying this um, transacetylization reaction, so using mass spectrometry to look at gas phase ion molecule reactions. This is like very like organic chemistry. And I realized at that point, okay, I love mass spec. Mass spec is really cool. But I also realized, okay, looking at intermediates of organic reactions in the gas phase is not really for me. So it's really cool that now, after 15 years, I'm still using the same core technology, which is mass spectrometry and chemical analysis, but in a completely different application, which is in cancer diagnosis and clinical analysis. And it's been really uh, important for me through this journey in academic research to realize really what was my passion. And now I can say for sure that my passion is to use chemical technology and mass spec technology to advance human health. And the way that this transition happened was by really being able to recognize critical clinical needs and think about ways that we could adapt the technologies that are like in our labs or like in R&D and research in a way that's like meaningful and useful for clinical professionals. So I took a lot of thinking to get to that point, but also as a chemist, and I don't know what you guys majors is, but as a, as a chemist, for me what was really important was to actually be in the hospitals, and that's the way that I really started to get ideas for new applications. So when I was in my PhD at Purdue University, um, I would go to the hospitals to collect samples, and I would literally just stay there, like waiting for samples, <coughs> And that's when I got to see, okay, wow, these are how clinical decisions are made. These are how um, surgeons are deciding how to treat their patients. And at that point, I realized, okay, we can make changes to our current technologies in the lab in order to be able to address this big clinical problem. So these, this is one of the, the questions that I love answering in my lab now as I conduct research. And the main question that I have my students think about as well. How can we adapt and simplify mass spectrometry technologies while we maintain sufficient analytical performance to address critical problems in health-related research and clinical practice? So my research is not really driven by a fundamental question, like we're not trying to understand like different energy states and molecules or reaction dynamics. We're really based on clinical needs. And um, you know, that's really my passion. And I love doing that and being able to actually interact with surgeons, <coughs> clinicians, and patients um, almost every week. So let me just start you by trying let me just start by telling you the problem that we're trying to address specifically with the mass spec pain technology. Um, cancer is you know a topic that as was introduced is very emotional to many people. I'm sure many of you guys here, you know you're pretty young, know someone in your life, in your family, or your friends that have gone through cancer diagnosis and also treatment. And cancer surgery, so removal of the affected tissue, is still the main treatment option for the majority of the solid cancers. 
So most people that are diagnosed with cancer, and it can be breast, lung, pancreas, brain, will undergo surgery to remove that affected tissue. Now cancer surgeries are highly complex procedures. Um, this picture here, this is one of my collaborators. He's performing one of the most complex cancer surgeries, which is a Whipple procedure that's for pancreatic cancer. The pancreas is an organ that sits really like within our body cavity. So to get to it, there's a little bit of digging. And the cancer is all, the cancer, um, the pancreas is also really close to several organs. So it's really difficult to access the organ, but also hard to see exactly where the cancer is. So even for highly trained surgeons, it can be really hard to find where this cancer is in order to be able to resect it. Now the main goal of cancer surgery is to maximize removal of cancer tissue while minimizing removal of the adjacent normal tissue. And there are several reasons for that. Um, the main reason is that there's significant clinical data that shows that if you maximize the excision of tumor, like if you get all the tumor out, you're giving the patients the highest chances of survival. So that's really what's going to determine how much people are going to live after a surgery if, if you're really successful in removing out of the tumor. But there's a boundary there, right? Because you don't want to compromise the adjacent normal tissue. Because you want to be able to make sure that your patient can live well after surgery. A very obvious and, and, and scenario to think about is brain cancer, right? If you have a brain tumor, you'd hope that the surgeon would do a really good job resecting the tumor, but minimizing the removal of the adjacent normal tissue, which is very important for function, right, and for quality of life postoperatively. But for, even for really well-trained surgeons, and surgeons are incredibly smart, well-trained people, it can be very difficult to identify by just gross anatomy, just looking at the tissue while you're doing this procedure, where is this delicate boundary between the cancer tissue and the normal tissue. So it's such a, a hard um, thing to recognize that most of the surgeons end up using what we call frozen section evaluation in order to verify that in fact they've removed all the cancer during surgery. So I've been in ORs a lot, and the way that this happens is, is the following. So the, the, can, the surgeon will remove like the bulk of the tissue where she or he thinks the tumor is within, and then you have someone in the staff that will come in with a dish, and then they just place the specimen there, and they walk out of the room with this specimen and take it to adjacent room. So this is not in the OR anymore. So they come through this door here, and then there's a staff person there that will freeze this tissue really fast and just freeze it in like um, negative, in like liquid nitrogen or even like in the cryostat. And then they cut this tissue in like really thin slices. And if you guys done some um, staining, tissue staining, then they do um, what we call H&E staining, which are histologic dyes that will stain this tissue. And then this is what she's doing right, right here. So this is just a, a, a series of uh, dipping in different dyes. And then you have pathologists that are highly trained medical professionals that can look with light microscopy, so like a microscope, at these tissue sections. And they are able to tell, based on the cell morphology and the structure of the cell and tissue, if there's still cancer at the margin, so at the extremity of the surgical specimen or not. Now, this process has been used for over a hundred years in clinical practice and is still the gold standard for verifying margins during surgery. What do you guys think is the problem that happens when you freeze the tissue very quickly in the, in the frozen room? What's, what's the main component of our cells? That's easy. Water, okay? So when you quickly freeze this tissue in order to be able to section it, if you freeze water, what happens? What are you forming? Ice. So you have formation of these ice crystals. And the ice crystal will um, alter the morphology of the tissue to a point that it can be really hard for even a really well-trained pathologist to recognize in real time if the cells are actually cancer or normal. These cells end up looking a lot alike. And as a consequence of that, in about 20% of the times for pancreatic cancer, the reading that the pathologist makes from that tissue section is wrong. Meaning that the pathologist may say, the margin is negative, there's no cancer at the margin, but indeed there, were, there was cancer at the margin they were gonna find out after surgery. And then they will call back and tell the surgeon and they will finish and wrap up the surgery and then 
at the end, they find out post-operatively that there was still cancer at the margin. And that has huge implications. Obviously, there's huge implications for the patients, right? Because these patients are going home with an incomplete resection. So there's still cancer at the site of um, this surgery. So there's incredible cost for the healthcare system. These people will have to come back for second surgeries in order to be able to remove this tumor. Or they're going to have to undergo a much um, harsher chemotherapy <coughs> postoperatively to be able to kill these cells. And this is really also really costly for the healthcare system. Surgeries are very expensive procedures. So in addition to that, it also increases the risk for the patients because now they're gonna be exposed to more anesthesia, more chances of surgical infection from um, having repeated surgeries as well. But cancer surgery is not the only clinical scenario where identification of tissue is critical. Uh, there's some images here that um, I hope it's okay for you guys to see. <laughs> I showed this to some high school students and then I saw like their faces and they're like, oh my gosh, let's get this slide. So this is the case of a parathyroid surgery. So parathyroid is right here close to the thyroid gland. Um, it's a lot of people have <coughs> parathyroidism and they have to remove their parathyroid. So this here is a parathyroid gland. Now these glands look a lot alike lymph nodes. So right here is a lymph node. So a lot of the times the surgeons, just by gross anatomy, have a really hard time identifying is this lymph node or is this a parathyroid? Is this a lymph node or a parathyroid? And the same thing for this gland. So they end up using that same procedure, that frozen section, just to make sure they remove the right organ. So here, it would be incredible if they had a technology that could identify the tissue type. Oops. In the same way, in endometriosis surgery, endometriosis is a disease where the lining of a woman's uterus, so that those epithelial cells grow outside of the uterus, and you can find these lesions even in the lung of some women, and they need to be removed. And this can be an endometriosis lesion, this can be a lesion, and all these red spots here could be a lesion as well. So it's really hard for a surgeon to correctly identify the disease in order to remove it. So I would argue to you today that there's a really big need for new technologies that can help surgeons better identify tissue more rapidly in the operating room, but also with a lot higher level of precision and accuracy in order to make the surgical reception. For cancer surgery, this is a very obvious need, but there's also needs outside of cancer surgeries to do that, to help surgeons make better decisions and better treatment for their patients. So you may have heard of some more traditional technologies that are used in the clinic to do this. Immunohistochemistry is a very well-developed assay, as well as gene sequencing technology. But all of these assays here are performed after surgery. So you'd only have an answer after like a week, <coughs> a week and a half, to know if all the cancer was removed or not. And then there are other approaches using spectroscopy, this is Raman, optical coherence tomography, and also fluorescence probes that are being developed now to address this problem in the clinical room. The issues with these is that none of these technologies offer the level of chemical specificity and sensitivity that mass spectrometry does. And I'll show you some data today that I think will convince you of that. So the solution that my lab came up to this problem is what we call the mass spec pen technology. Oops. So the mass spec pen is a handheld device, and I have a video that I'll show you how it works. Not a video. Can you play my video? this 
do the tubing system to the mass spectrometer. The mass spectrometer does real-time molecular analysis of the tissue, and you have these profiles that are characteristic of normal or cancer tissue, and I'll ex explain exactly how that happens. What's really cool about the mass spec pan is that we designed it as a completely disposable and easy to use device. So after you use it, you literally unplug it from the machine. My lab is in NHB, sixth floor, so just stop by if you want to take a look. We can just unplug it from the machine and throw it in the trash. So it's very easy to use and compatible for clinical work. So let's take a closer look. This was our first version of the mask by pen. We used 3D printing to produce these. This is just a case, and then we have three PTFE tubings that we connect to the pen tip. The pen tip is really where most of the design and went into in the engineering. So we have in this pen tip, which is made of PDMS, polydimethylsiloxane. PDMS is widely used in implants. So it's FDA approved, it's safe for use in humans. So there's no really issue here of risk to the patient. In this tip here, how I showed you, there are three conduits. The first conduit we use for the droplet delivery. And we use here as the solvent pure water. And I get asked that a lot of the time, why do we use pure water? Because if you're thinking about a chemical extraction, you normally want to make a mixture of solvents, like something that would extract more hydrophilic and hydrophobic compounds. But we use water because water is fully biocompatible. So there's, again, no additional risk to the patient. So once this water contacts the tissue, we get extraction of polar compounds to the water droplet. So I don't know if you guys have taken 455 or 456, anyone? Um, this process here of chemical extraction is really like one of the most basic chemical uh, processes that are known. Um, molecules that are soluble in water and has any kind of affinity for the water droplet literally will absorb from the tissue and move into this water droplet. And then we have these water droplets that are rich in molecules that are characteristic of the tissue that are then analyzed using mass spectrometry. Other processes that we use with water extraction is like every morning when you make a coffee. It's kind of the same process where you're using water to extract compounds from a solid material. When you guys take a shower, it's another form of chemical extraction, right? You're using water to take compounds of your body. So in the very same way here, we use water to remove molecules from the tissue. Most of the times we contact the probe to the tissue for about three seconds, and that gives us enough time to have an efficient extraction. Of course, if you sit the mass spec in for longer on the tissue, you're gonna get even more and more extraction, but it just kind of becomes awkward to hold like something in the same position for too long. So now in the operating room, and I'll show you our clinical data, we normally hold the pin for like three to five seconds on the tissue. And then the transportation from the droplet tip to the mass spectrometer is about two to three seconds. So the whole process from touching the tissue and triggering with the foot paddle to a uh, mass spectrum is under 10 seconds total per spot. So it's really, really quick. Now because we're using 3D printing, the opening of this tip is what defines our resolution or the area that's being sampled. And so we just do, you know, different printing and we uh, optimize this opening to whatever we want. Um, we've used from down to 500 <coughs> micrometers to about 5 millimeters in this opening. And again, it's really depending on the surgical need. Um, for breast cancer, for example, you'd want to probe a larger area around the whole area that's been removed, like in the lumpectomy. For brain cancer, the margin is much narrower. So you can really adapt it depending on the surgical need and, and the desire of the surgeon. Okay, so once the droplet goes into the mass spectrometer, this is the type of data that we get. This is what we call a mass spectrum. And even if you don't know anything about mass spectrometry, I promise this is going to look simple to you in just a couple seconds. So in the y-axis, what we have is the mass to charge ratio. Um, so that means it's the mass of the molecule that's detected divided by whatever charge we put on these molecules. Most of the times we ionize these molecules by adding one charge. So what you're reading is actually the mass of the molecule because it's the mass divided. And then in Y is the intensity of these molecules. So if you don't know anything about mass spec, just look at the profiles of these peaks. With mass spectrometry analysis, we can go back and now see at 146.045, you can do identification of this molecule and you know, okay, this has got to be glutamate which is a very important molecule related to energy and metabolism in our cells. So in the same way, in the low range of this spectrum, you get a lot of metabolites. 
And there's uh, significant data uh, for biology studies that show alteration in metabolic pathways because of can in cancer cells. So there's a lot of precedence to show that changes in metabolisms are important, is important in cancer. And then in the mid mass range, we detect a lot of fatty acids, so natural fatty acids that are in your cell. And then in the higher mass range, we detect complex lipids, like a, a, the, the lipid bilayer in our cells, right, the membrane lipids. These are significantly altered in cancer cells. So now, by looking at these profiles of molecules, and this analysis is not quantitative, we can rapidly identify if this pattern is characteristic of a high-grade ovarian cancer, of a low-grade ovarian cancer, or of normal ovary. So even if you didn't know anything about this mass spectrum, just based on pattern recognition, and this is highly reproducible, you would be able to tell that these are different tissues, and then if you do enough analysis with a large number of samples, you'd be able to derive statistically significant patterns of molecules that are characteristic of each disease type. And that's what we do with statistical analysis, and I'll show you how we do that in a couple slides. So our analysis is mostly based on what we call metabolomics. So these are all small molecules. I put some structures here because I'm a chemist. I love structures and molecules. I'm sure you guys do too. <laughs> but a lot of these molecules are what we call a small molecules. Small molecules are molecules below um, like a thousand in molecular weight. So we absorb them very easily from tissue. And we can do this in the negative ion mode when we're attaching one negative charge or positive ion mode. What's, what, what's really neat about this type of mass spectrum analysis is that we can get this mass spectrum in 50 milliseconds. So the analysis in the mass spectrometer is extremely quick. Like these are really high performance instruments. What's adding the 10 seconds of time is really just the sampling. And we directly inject this droplet of water into the mass spectrometer. So by, in this way, we get really high performance and sensitivity <laughs> for analysis with really high levels of chemical specificity, meaning that we know what these molecules are, but in a really fast way as well. So that's why this technology is extremely powerful. Now, a lot of people ask me why metabolites, and the reason that we like to use metabolites is that metabolites are really a functional readout of what's going on in the <coughs> cell. So the metabolites is like the real-time picture of the biological processes that are going on in your body right now. Not only the transcript levels, so if you're thinking about DNA transcribing to RNA, transcript levels do not always correlate with the protein levels, and the protein levels do not always translate to function. But metabolites really give you a real-time picture of what's going on um, in your body as it relates to disease. So we like to probe metabolites, and they're also really easy to get out from the tissue. Okay, one of my favorite features about the mass spec pen is the analysis is non-destructive from a perspective of the histology of the tissue. So this, for example, is a piece of lung tissue. So it's a piece of a, it's patient tissue that had lung cancer. This is before analysis. This is during the mass spectrum analysis. And this is after. And I don't know what's going on here with the graphics, but I, I'm glad the tissue is good to see. This is the region that was analyzed. So if you amplify here, you would never be able to tell that we've analyzed it. There's no obvious damage to the tissue. So this traction is very, very gentle. So just imagine like if you like, put some water on the <laughs> tissue. It's not going to um, destroy it in any way. And I cannot stress enough how important this is because now it's, we can incorporate this into a clinical workflow without telling a doctor or a clinical professional that they have to change the way they already do things. So by adding this level of molecular analysis, they can still do universal chemistry, gene sequencing postoperatively, they can still do frozen section analysis. It's just one additional step in between that's really quick that can give you an additional level of precision and accuracy in surgical practice. And dealing with clinical professionals, this is a really important feature, okay? It's really hard to tell a surgeon or a doctor that's been doing some sort of clinical procedure for like 10, 15 years. They've been trained on this, a lot of money and a lot of time to learn what they do, to incorporate a new technology that might disturb things and add time to their essay can be really difficult. So the idea that you can do this without interfering with the workflow um, is, is something that um, is very attractive uh, for clinical professionals. So we also tested this in vivo in our first studies. This is before, during, and after analysis with an animal model. This is not that relevant anymore because I'll show you human data today in the operating room. 
Okay, so this is how the kind of our platform looks like. Um, this is the handheld device, the mouse pad pen. This is the foot pedal. It's um, the mouse pad pen is directly connected to our bright orange box, of course. In our orange box, we call it our integrated mouse pad interface. That's where like we just throw everything in there to make it look nice and neat. So we have an Arduino microcontroller. You guys use that Raspberry Pi microcontrollers. Um, so we have all of our codes in, 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 in the microcontroller and all of the stops are automated. <coughs> so once you click the foot paddle, it will activate um, with the microcontroller all of the analysis in the mass spectrometer, the dropper delivery, everything. Even the software statistical analysis is all automatic. So there's no really anything that the surgeon needs to do. And then we have the mass spec part. This is the most expensive part, guys. So the pins are super cheap, right? All plastic, disposable. A mass spectrometer, how much you think the mass spec costs? Come on. 50 dollars Yeah, one more, one more bet. 200,000. 200,000. One more, guys. Let's go up. <laughs> so the one that they've been using is uh, half a million dollars for this project. Five minutes. I should have said 500,000. This sounds bad. Half a million. And the reason for that is going back to my very first slide. These instruments are built for R&D, research and development. They're not built as clinical instrumentation. The, the capabilities of this mass spectrometer is so much beyond what we need for this type of analysis that now we are working with the manufacturers to make a smaller, compact, and cheaper mass spectrometer that would be like a roll-in version that could be, have you guys seen like an ultrasound when they roll, up, roll in and out in like operating rooms? Just like that. It can come a lot closer to the patient, a lot easier to use. So we hope that we can drop this price to about 50 to 100K. And I think that's totally feasible. Okay? And then we've done a lot of work with statistical classifiers and software tools as well. So when I did this team here, some people would say, oh, this is just like a cute version of what you have in your lab. It's probably a lot more complex. So I had my research associate just kind of like pose, just like the, <laughs> the surgeon. <laughs> so this is Jeline John. He's my research associate, and he's incredible. He's been in the very beginning in this project. This is the mass spec pen. This is our not very burnt orange, but it's orange uh, box connected to the mass spectrometer. And this is the computer as well. Here's the clip that took out. So this is exactly how it looks. Okay, okay. <laughs> Okay, so once we get these profiles of molecules in the form of mass spectrum, then we have to use some sort of statistical analysis to see what's actually statistically relevant and significant, right? Are we just seeing random patterns of molecules or do they actually, are they actually predictive of disease state? And then we need to build classifiers so that it's not us looking at peaks, but machine learning, right, and algorithms can automatically recognize what these patterns are. So I'm sure you guys have heard, all have heard about machine learning, right? We need to talk about that. Okay, good. So we start from histologically validated tissue. So tissues that we know for sure are cancer, we know for sure are normal. Then we do a ton of data pre-processing, and this is just to build our methods. And then we use the lasso algorithm. It's, this is a logistic regression technique, like a linear regression analysis, to build a model based on a sparse set of these molecules that are highly predictive of disease state. So you go from thousands of molecules, thousands of metabolites, and you shrink this down to about 100 predictive markers. And these markers we use cross-validation and do several reiterations of this data analysis to know that these are the most predictive of disease state. And then we start casting this model on new tissues that come in, okay? So the same way that Facebook tags you in a picture, we're using machine learning here to tag a mass spectrum as cancer and normal. So this is um, our graphical user interface. So you can select the mass spec pin method, what surgery you're doing, breath are going over it. We have a lot more now. And then once you press the foot paddle, do the analysis, let go. There's a, an auto cue when it's over. So you just remove the pin. And then the software will run through and you get the spectrum, the diagnosis, and the associated probability. Statistical analysis is always going to be a probability associated with it meaning that it's not always 100%, of course, but we can continue to build our methods to improve on that. Okay, so this is just a table to show you some of our performance. In our very first paper that we published in 2017, we reported about 96.3% accuracy with about 250 <coughs> tissues, breast, lung, ovary, and thyroid. 
And then since then, we've expanded now. Now we've passed 700 tissues that we've done in my lab. And these are all human tissues that we get from our collaborations with MD Anderson, Baylor College of Medicine, and also Dell. Um, we've looked now at brain, thyroid, lung, pancreas, ovarian cancer, and breast cancer. Non-destructive for all of these organs, really rapid, 10 seconds, and we have about 97% accuracy. Now, we've not only <laughs> looked at um, cancer versus normal, but we can also subtype cancer. So different cancer subtypes have different metabolism. So if we detect these met metabolic changes, we can actually tell what type of cancer, what is the aggressiveness, and this is really important for a surgeon in order to determine their treatment strategy for the patients. Okay, so I explained, 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 explained it, but Dr. Weber is amazing. Um, he's in Gray's Anatomy, and he can explain it a lot better than me to you today. So when you apply the PAP pen to tissue, it rapidly identifies whether a cell is healthy or cancerous. So you're showing us a mock-up. No, no, it's functional. And it's still in the testing stage, but uh, at this point, approximately 80% of all tumor types we sample are in the database. And we hope for 100% in the next few months. Wow. That is impressive. 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 It's like a drug-sniffing dog for cancer. Or swoosh. Our idea is good, too. Compares biomarkers from the tissue that goes up. Okay, let's kind of cut there, but I have a few more data to show you. So the mass back end was featuring Grey's Anatomy under the name of Path Pen, and it's been hilarious to see like the um, reaction from the public. Like sometimes, like when we post something, people will write like Doctor, this is like copying from Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> <laughs> like oh, this idea was like Doctor Weber's. Like all the time, and then like I just click like like and like feel like a smiling face, and it's just whatever, you can think whatever you want. But it's been hilarious to see how many people have seen this show first, and then they found out about the mass spec band, and they think it was in that direction. But it was the other way around, so it was the producers that got in touch with us and featured it on the show, so it's been really cool to see that. So I just want to show you some results for pancreatic cancer, kind of looping back what I showed you in the beginning. Pancreatic cancer is a really big problem. It's the fourth leading cause in cancer death. Only 8.5 people, 8.5% of the people that are diagnosed will live past five years. That's like awful. And the only treatment option for pancreatic cancer is, is surgery. There's not good chemotherapy for pancreatic cancer. So most patients will have to undergo surgery. So pancreatic cancer is super heterogeneous. So it's a tissue type that is not just all normal or all or cancer is super easy to see. No. These are like cancer cells that are diffuse, they're infiltrating, there might be, you know, five cancer cells here, then a bunch of normal tissue, and then inflammation and necrosis in blood. It's super tricky to identify cancer cells in the margins of the pancreas in the operating room. And I just wanted to show some example of that. Sometimes you have a piece of tissue that's normal, and then you look and that's a lot of inflammation, then you start to look like cancer, but this is just inflammation. So it's been really, it can be really hard to identify. These are actually normal cells. And then you have a piece of cancer that have, okay, a lot of cancer cells in this case, but then if you go just a few, you know, centimeters um, away from that, then you have about 25% tumor and a lot of normal cells. So it can be really difficult to see this with um, light microscopy, so like under a microscope. So we started to use the mass spec pen for this analysis. These are just some of the mass spectrum. Again, even if you don't know any chemistry, any mass spec, these are profiles of normal pancreas, pancreatic carcinoma. Very different, very different um, abundance and distribution of molecules. We go through and identify all of these peaks because we love it and we're chemists in my lab. So we know all, what all they are, like ascorbic acid, fatty acids, glycerophosphatonolamines, glycerophosphatonolamines, and we build this method and we have 99% accuracy for cancer diagnosis. So we're doing really, really well with pancreas. And then we started to predict on these very complex um, tissues. So we work really closely with our pathologists and we kind of sit side by side with pathologists. And I think that's something that is really special to my PhD students and my undergraduate students because they get to do these interactions. They're like in the clinic, sitting down with pathologists and looking through patient data. And then we just write down all of our notes, you know, all of the complications of these tissues, and then we start to predict. And we've gotten agreement 
with cancer, even when there's like just 5% tumor cells. So it's been really exciting. And then for the majority of the cases, we're getting it right. A few cases, we've been getting it wrong, too. So we want to improve our classifiers. But still, we are at a really good um, accuracy rates now, even for these really complex tissues. We also look at metastatic tissue. So remember, um, in my introduction, um, we, we, there's a lot of patients that are diagnosed at an advanced stage, so they already have metastatic cancer. It is really important to identify these sites of metastasis to improve chances of survival. This is a pancreatic cancer. This is um, bile duct that's really close to the pancreas, completely infiltrated with pancreatic cancer. And this is normal bile duct. And you can see the, this profile looks a lot more similar to the pancreatic cancer than from normal bile duct. So we can identify cancer even in metastatic positions in the body. Now going back to the tissue identification that I showed you with thyroid, parathyroid, and lymph node. Why is it so hard to see? Okay. Parathyroid and lymph node, we've been typing tissue as well. And in typing, we've been getting over like 100% agreement. So to identify organs is really easy for us. Um, different organs have completely different profiles. So this is an application that we're also really excited about. And you can see some of this factor here, how different they are, even qualitatively looking at these peaks. So it's been really special to be at UT, obviously because UT is the best. And you know, we have incredible departments and researchers here in chemistry. I collaborate with biomedical engineering, with statistics, computational sciences, biochemistry, and molecular biology. Um, but it's also really cool because we have a medical school here at UT, but we're just two hours away from the Texas Medical Center. And collectively, MD Anderson and Baylor College of Medicine, they see over 5 million patients a year. This is incredible, huge resources for clinical research. So it's been really cool to partner with these institutions to do this analysis. So we started to translate from the lab to the clinic. And that was um, like in the fall of last year. So it took forever to get, have you guys heard of like an IRB protocol? So to get the sub human subject research approved. But once we did, we started to um, move from the laboratory here in NHB to the clinic in the operating room. So all my students were part of this effort. This is generation two of the mass spec prints a lot cuter now. Um, this is just resin that we 3D print. We actually write our logo <coughs> in mass spec pen. This is the PDMS tip, the tubing. And we make these all in my lab. These are some of my undergraduate students and graduate students. We've made over 300 of them. And then we pack them in these little bags and we ship them with FedEx to Houston. And then these fans undergo the same clinical procedure as any other medical device. They're sterilized and they go as a medical device to the operating room. So this is when we shipped um, my instrument. This is that mass spectrometer that you saw. We have a generation two interface where we can plug two pans in, in tandem. So once one is using, we can like prime the next one. And this is me, my graduate student, my research associate, when we actually shipped it in the truck. So we're really excited. So, again, Dr. Rapper, and we did this surgery. Let's see that. We're first. on a testing stage. We're testing it? On this guy? He's got a wife and two kids. They're very nice, and they really, really want him to stay alive. And I promised them I'd make sure he gets the best possible care. So, maybe, Dr. Gray, if you could just tell Dr. Wilson. Be quiet. She's got it. Look, the distal end. <laughs> Have no carcinoma. And if I go one centimeter approximately, it works. <laughs> it's working. Oh my god. I'm gonna save half his stomach. Now you get to go tell his family that not only did you save his life, you saved his quality of life. I'm gonna go check on our stoners. So just to conclude. Um, the mass pen is user-friendly, based on molecular analysis, biocompatible, disposable, non-destructible. Um, we are now adapting it for robotic and laparoscopic surgery, so it can be adapted to different modalities. It is also suitable for use pre-operative, so outside of the operating room, and after the procedures as well. Our hope really is to redefine surgery by improving, this was an arrow up, improving accuracy in diagnosis, precision in surgery, as also expediting procedures with the expectation of reducing healthcare, healthcare costs and the second rate of surgeries, which really benefit patients, improving patient experience and outcome. So um, I'll skip this video and I'll get to our, and you can go off and look at the Graves Anatomy episodes. They featured in four, um, three episodes so far. So it's been really cool to see that. 
that I just want to finish by quoting our Vice, um, Vice President Joe Biden, who lost a son to brain cancer. So um, as someone in, in policy and politics, he um, experienced that in firsthand like the pains of, of um, cancer diagnosis. And he said that every day, every minute matters to patients. And we must bring that sense of urgency to our cancer research and care systems. And that's kind of, of similar to um, how we do research in my lab. We really take this research with high responsibility. We're really productive. Um, we get research grants and we span our grants and we're doing research as fast as we can with the highest quality that we can as well. And our ultimate motivation are actually the patients. These are um, some emails that I get almost every week from people that say, hey, you know, my daughter, this is actually a, a, a parent. Here in the first line it said, you know, my daughter is six years old and we found a nodule in her thyroid. You know, I hope this technology will work. Where can I go? Which hospitals it's available? Um, this is another friend that had a nodule and wanted to know if it was available to the surgeon. This was a breast cancer patient. She's written me several times asking, hey, can I be part of your study? And this is another parent with a daughter with endometriosis that's had, I think, five surgeries, he said, and they can't figure out a way to get it all out. So hoping that we would improve um, reception there. So this is my lab. Um, my graduate students are mostly in chemistry, Spencer in statistics. Um, I have some people in um, biomedical engineering, John, Shirley, um, Grace was in the lab for a little bit, and also computational sciences, and we're like a mixture. We, I have 11 grad students now, and 45 undergrads in that lab. So it's just been really neat to work with these guys and make some really cool progress, and also I want to thank my clinical collaborators, which is, are essential to my research. These are medical professionals that go out of their way in their clinical workflow to test something new and exciting and you know, try to help their patients in an even better way. And ultimately, I have to thank my funding. Um, the University of Texas is awesome for believing in me and giving me a startup um, almost four years ago that enabled me to buy my instrumentation, all of those 500,000 mass spectrometers. I have four now, um, so you can calculate. <laughs> the Cancer Prevention um, and Research Institute of Texas, I have three research grants with secret. Um, two of them are over a million dollars as well, so incredible support from the state of Texas, which you know a lot of taxpayers like you guys contribute to, um, maybe your parents. Um, the National Institute of Health and the National Cancer Institute, and a lot of foundations have kind of partnered with us in providing us funding to to do these studies. These are expensive studies, but I think you know the technology is really transformative, and we hope to make a, a really big impact in how patients are being treated. So, with that, that's all I have to say. Thank you guys for staying, and I'll take um, any questions that you. Have.